Make sure you tap that. You're going to okay. tap that right there, and you're going to hit start. Okay. Like that. Cool. All right, next up we have Kashish Mittal with No One Left Behind, Security Defense Through Gamification, Including CTFs. Please give him a warm Torcon welcome. Thanks, guys. Yeah, so I'll be presenting on No One Left Behind, Security Defense Through Gamifications. You guys can still hear me? Cool. Right, so I actually work as a security education engineer at Elevate Security. Um, before that, I was working at Duo, and I've worked at a couple of banks before that. So just to let you guys know, I have an Indian accent. This is how I speak. I'm not trying to do a bit, or I'm not trying to pretend to be Apu. So this is the next 20 minutes of your life. OK, so why, why should you guys listen to me, right? So I did my bachelor's and master's at CMU, so I have a bit of idea about security. I have gone through security education training at more than five organizations with varying scale. Um, I'm a member of PPP, so hopefully some of you guys know us. And a lot of the security that I have learned is through CTFs. So I think you know that can be replicated for other people. Okay, so let's do some exercise before lunch, right? How many of you actually have some sort of education security, or you know, security education, information security training at your companies? Show of hands. So pretty much the entire room. I can see a couple of people not raising hands. Probably they're not paying attention, but that's fine. <laughs> so out of those people, how many of you think that the training that you guys get um, actually helps an employee fight a sophisticated or a dedicated attacker? Okay, you guys put down your hands way faster than I anticipated. Like I had follow-up questions, but I can literally see two people's hands up. So yeah, basically the idea is we have training today, but um, I don't believe, and the industry doesn't believe that you know it helps you fight against a sophisticated attacker, or it actually helps a lot of people contribute in a positive manner to the security posture. So that's you know basically the issue that we are trying to solve. So the idea behind my research, my work, this presentation, is to improve the security skills and the security behavior of technical as well as non-technical employees. Remember, like we don't want to leave anyone behind. That's basically the idea. So what are some of the issues with current day or you know, industry standard security training? Firstly, there is a one-size-fits-all solution, right? So if you're a security engineer or if you're a developer, you don't get the same sales training as a sales guy or a sales engineer, right? So why do we give the same security education or the same security training to everyone else in the company? That doesn't make sense. Second, a lot of times it's assumed that the employees, especially non-technical ones, aren't good enough to do something. It's not that case. A lot of times they just don't care. So we have to address that. Third, a lot of times training actually takes place, but the organizations don't care about measuring the effectiveness of training. So you know, they, you were at X level before that, you did some training, whether you went above, below, you remain the same, the organization doesn't care. Or they don't measure it, or they don't collect feedback. So you really don't know how effective it was, whether it helped the employees or not. And one thing I want to note out here is, Compliance and attendance requirements or completion, they are not you know, measures of effectiveness. So if somebody comes up, you go up to your CISO or your CEO and say, OK, 70% of the people completed the training, that means nothing. Like you don't know whether you know, it helped them, whether their security posture improved or not. And lastly, we care about retention. So if they learn something and they forget it in the next day, you know, they don't really implement it, the training isn't as successful. So these are some of the issues that we want to fix. Before that, let's actually talk about why gamification can help. So the idea here is gamification provides a bunch of you know, advantages that traditional video-based or you know, even looking through a doc and answering some MCQs doesn't. So one of them is like the points, levels, just like you, know, you play in a video game. Um, there is a puzzle-based format, right? So a lot of times you're answering security questions or uh, you're actually solving uh, a CTF challenge. 
So it's more like a competition rather than you know just like an MCQ test. Uh, if you implement it company wide, there's often healthy competition between the employees. They want to like you know outscore each other on points, etc. We have tried this at some of the companies that I've worked at. So you can organize like a CTF night where a lot of people do this together. So it's like a fun activity for them to do, and you know prizes, which is one of the biggest motivations, anyways. So yeah. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with CTFs, so CTFs basically stands for Capture the Flag. Um, as it stands today, it's an infosec co competition, mostly played by you know security folks or people who are interested in security. Um, it's a web-based uh, version of the actual physical game. So I'm sure like some of you might have heard the physical game where you go around in the real world finding clues and ultimately you get a flag or an object. So it's like an online version of that. Um, instead of finding flags, you basically find strings of alphanumeric characters which give you the points. You have both attack and defense-based challenges, a lot of different categories like you know reversing, web, crypto, forensics, other stuff, which actually help you gain a lot of practical skills that you need to succeed as a security engineer or even as a developer thinking about security. Uh, some of the famous CTFs you might have heard of are DEF CON CTF, Seesaw CTF, um, you know, Plaid, Google CTF, Pico CTF. I think there's one going on outside also, so yeah. Um, so I went to CMU where we actually organized Pico CTF. Um, that's, as far as we know, the world's largest hacking competition. This year, Pico 2017, uh, more than 18,000 students played. So it's catered more towards, uh, you know, high school students, college students, uh, trying to, you know, get them um, interested in cybersecurity and think about security as a career. And this year, we had an exponential increase in the number of participants to 18,000. And uh, one of the things that we added this year was the gamification version. So you could still go and play you know, the black and white text command line interface and just you know, solve the challenges. Or as you can see in the picture, you can go and you know, play um, the puzzle based or the video game format. You still are solving security challenges, but you know, sometimes you get hints and stuff like that. So this has you know, really appealed uh, to kids. Um, so we discussed about some of the security issues earlier, right? How do CTFs actually ad address some of those issues? So firstly, you can create customized content. As I discussed earlier, you don't want to provide the same level of training to everyone. And what CTFs or CTF challenges allow you to do is actually uh, define it in terms of their job function. So whether they work in a tech space or a non-tech space, whether they work as a sales engineer, a security engineer, a lawyer, a finance person, and also on their job function. Uh, so the uh, sorry, their job level. So you know whether they're you know starting, whether they're supposed to be CISO, whether they're supposed to be uh, you know VP of sales. So you can customize the challenges based on that. Uh, one advantage, apart from all of this that it provides you, is um, you can also evaluate their scale or their level of security awareness beforehand before providing the training. So you don't want to provide redundant training to employees. Like if I already know everything there is to know about phishing or most of the stuff, and you start by saying, okay, this is what spam is, or this is what, how a phishing link works, my interest is gone in the first five seconds. So you don't really want to do that. So you can you know, fix this by actually starting them with more technically evolved CTF challenges. So yeah, like I have a couple of examples of you know, non-tech challenges that you could create. So you guys can take a minute to probably read through it. And yeah, just to clarify, like these are dummy accounts that we create, so we're not encouraging them to break real world accounts or anything. It's all simulated. Yep. So the idea behind this challenge is to, you know, educate them not to use any publicly available information uh, in their passwords. Similarly, um, another challenge that we created is this. As you guys can probably guess, the lesson here is don't reuse your passwords and have different passwords. And if you need a password manager with that, that's fine. So yeah, the other thing that we discussed about is motivation. So this is actually one of the toughest parts to solve. And that's why this it makes this area hard. Because you're trying to deal with a wide array of people, right? So everybody has their different set of motivations. So you need to kind of appeal to all and you know create a, a solution that works for pretty much everyone. 
And that's why you know you can use a bunch of gamification rewards. Uh, so some common things that you know work is manager appreciation in your one-on-one. -on -one. Um, if you guys have like a public shout-out forum or like a Slack channel, giving the guy credit there. Um, a lot of people like swag, um, gift cards, you know, Slack badges. So this is this is something that has to be customized p as per your organization, depending on where you work and what your employees value. Um, you have to give them that incentive. We actually ran a survey at one of the companies, and we offered them either a gift card or, you know, like a recommendation letter from their, uh, you know, engineering manager. And inevitably, everyone chose uh, the recommendation letter, except for security engineers. Security engineers wanted the gift card. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, the other thing is to actually analyze the result of the CTFs. So just like we mentioned earlier, uh, there, there isn't enough you know, analysis of how their security awareness changed before and after. So CTFs kind of do that for you automatically. So if somebody solves, let's assume, a phishing question or like, you know, a password hygiene question or a reversing challenge, so you know, you know what level they were at earlier and you know, at least the bump that they've gotten by solving these challenges. The other thing is you can measure this very well. You can measure this on an individual level. You want to silo it in terms of team or you know, measure the entire company. This can be done. So you get a lot more insight in, into who is it working for, who is it not working for, and stuff like that. And finally, um, a lot of research has shown that active learning uh, and you know, experiential learning is much better than pa passive uh, in term for in terms of you know, retaining it uh, longer. So firstly, what we use in CTFs is learning by doing methodology. So instead of teaching me what a Caesar cipher is or you know, how to decrypt a message, you just ask me to do it, and I learn as I do it. Um, the other thing is CTFs actually help employees get into the attacker mindset. So a lot of people who are not as familiar with the security space as security engineers are, it, it gets their you know, thought process going about how could their attacker uh, you know, go about breaking the system for me or how could they at attack me. And then also a follow-up of you know, how I could try and you know, defend against this or how I could stop this. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, experiential, active learning, much, much more retaining than you know, like passive learning, just looking at a video or just reading a doc. Um, there are some other ancillary benefits. Um, so you can find out what level um, of security awareness an employee is before giving them the training. Um, it's highly scalable. So a lot of solutions that were discussed here or at other conferences is, is you know, like having a tabletop exercise or having one-on-ones with the employees. So that doesn't really scale. But for this, you, all you have to do is deploy one uh, you know, CTF with different challenges throughout your company, and you have the back end to analyze. So it scales. Like even if you scale from 100 to 500 people, uh, you know, there's not a lot of work. The only incremental work is maybe after every six months you want to update the challenges and get the employees to work on new challenges. So that's much easier than you know, uh, running the exercise for those 500 people. Um, and yeah, like another thing is you can measure their awareness, their effectiveness as you train them. So you know, they are being trained by doing those challenges and if you solve a particular tough challenge, you understand that the employee you know, gets that thing. So it kind of works both ways. You know what level they are and you know, as they improve their level, you constantly get updated. Um, so, yep, these are some of the advantages. Um, some key takeaways from my slide, uh, from my presentation, sorry. Um, so I think all of us agreed, um, or at least by show of hands, that was a consensus that current methods of security training and awareness are not great. Um, training needs to be customized and, you know, based on job function and level uh, to have maximum return on investment. Um, really important to motivate your employees so that they actually care about security and you know want to be involved in contributing to the security posture. Active and experiential learning uh, helps retain better uh, than passive. And yeah, like whatever training method you guys adopt, be sure to actually measure the effectiveness of it um, afterwards. Uh, we've we've seen CTFs work great, so give it a shot at your organization. Questions.
Yeah, so it depends on how you want to frame the war game, right? So for example, there was a talk here yesterday um, talking about you know, how to simulate uh, war games as tabletop exercises. So you know, that can also work, but in my opinion, that's not a really scalable solution because you're having that exercise per team or per group that you want to manage. Uh, but if in the other case, like for example, CTFs or the case that you mentioned where you can deploy it once and everybody can you know, play at it, play at the game or play the game at their own time, uh, that helps a lot because as I'm presuming you're from you know, that organization and you want to deploy it, you don't want to spend time on developing content or organizing that uh, tabletop exercise again and again. So yeah, like gamification and war games help because of the ideas that I mentioned. CTFs is one way to do it, and also it's like a scalable way to do it. You don't have to deploy challenges again and again. So, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, sorry, your hand first. I'll get back to you. Yeah. Yeah, so there are a couple of products. So um, if you want to like try a beginner CTF, uh, Pico CTF is actually one of the good ones because uh, it's catered towards people who pretty much have like you know who's just starting security. So if you want to like deploy it throughout your organization and give it to non-technical people, that's a good one. Um, as of today, there is no good customized uh, you know per organization solution. So if that's what you're looking for, that doesn't exist, and that's why we are speaking about it. If it already existed, I could have just pointed you guys to that, saying, like, don't listen to my talk, just list, like see that. So yeah. Cool. Yeah. So somebody in the audience. I mean, you can come talk to me afterwards. I don't want to make it a vendor pitch, but yeah, you can come talk to me afterwards. Uh, you had a question. Uh, so, uh, so vendor pitch disclosures, I'm a company, so I mean, one of the challenges that we have is making good questions. Like, it's, it's, it's very difficult to yep. scale the challenges for the different actors. Yep. It's, it's not an easy way to go. Exactly. So Yeah, so this was our experience also. So we have kind of a head start because we run CTFs as part of PPP, we play in P CTFs. So you know we understand the space of forming problems. Uh, the other thing is um, you have to do some interaction with you know your non-tech employees because I'm presuming that's where the biggest challenge for you was. Uh, you have to kind of understand what level they are at and create challenges accordingly. So for example, the challenge about uh, password creation like not, not reusing the passwords that I, um, sure, let me actually pull it up. Yeah, so this might be something that's you know, completely trivial to your tech employees and you'll be like, you know, why am I wasting time with this? But this is not something for you know, the non-tech employees. So that's one, um, yeah, that's the, my best recommendation. Like as you do it more often, you'll get better at it. Any other questions? You have another question, yep. Yep, I know where you're coming from. Exactly. Yep. yep. So yeah, there is one company that's doing this for education in general, not security education. And we are doing this at my company, so if you want to talk about it, I can tell you. But basically his question was, you actually evaluate someone at the start that I mentioned. So in GRE what happens is, if you miss easy questions in your next section, you get, you know, questions of a lower aptitude. And if you answer really hard questions, then your you know, scale uh, uh, you know, increases. So you kind of vary the content based on the candidate or the employee's previous answers. So yeah, that actually helps, again, you know, keeping them engaged. Because if you give easy questions to people who know the stuff, they'll lose interest. You give really hard questions to people who have no idea what's going on, it's going to go the over their head, and they're not going to care. Yeah, so like uh, there are actually people who have made a living out of you know 
security behavior like behaviors in general how how do people change their behavior so for example the motivation piece uh, we got inspired by uh, this researcher out of stanford um, so he does that for a living like his whole life is dedicated to changing people's behaviors uh, similarly um, the other people working on this they have had you know a bunch of years of experience of how to actually train people so yeah we take that in account Yeah, so basically what we do is we create like a fake uh, Twitter account. Um, it can depend on, you know, what the organization needs are. So we can actually create like a fake account within their portal. So in that case, you know, you have more visibility. You can put in rules. With Twitter, they don't allow you to do a lot of that. But we've managed to make it work for both cases. Like I have myself created fake Facebook accounts uh, with that employee. And you kind of have to trust or tell the employees not to change the like passwords. Uh, but yeah, like. If somebody wants to mess with you, there are a bunch of ways that they can do that. So that's not an issue. OK, I think we are out of time. If you want any more questions, I'll be right outside. Thank you.